midway between the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. At the crossroads of entertainment and imagination, millions come to experience the wonder and excitement of Universal Orlando. Celebrate 25 years of innovation. We were hoping they got our picture whenever our face was doing this. <gasps> From E.T. Oh. All the way through Harry Potter. This ride was freaking awesome. Prepare to be amazed in this inside look behind the scenes at Universal Orlando. What does it take to construct mega rides and build immersive attractions? Hear from the creative experts that make it all happen. As you're flying around, you're actually sitting in a robot, and there are 48 other robots running around in the same space with you. That was unreal. We created Krusty Burger, because you have to have a Krusty Burger if you're at Springfield. <laughs> Halloween Horror Nights is quite literally living a horror film. In 2014, Universal Studios launched its most ambitious attraction to date with a salute to the Harry Potter franchise. But Universal's history has been rooted in pioneering, innovative, movie-inspired attractions. Its origins date back to the 1980s, when Steven Spielberg began consulting with the Universal team to deliver a destination beyond guests' expectations. The Ride to Movies idea was really coined by Steven Spielberg, who's been our creative consultant all the way along. And throughout the development of Universal Studios Florida, that was really the idea, to put people in these films and give them an opportunity to experience things like King Kong and Jaws and Earthquake. You know, these amazing pictures that prior to that, they don't be able to see and experience in the movies. Spielberg's vision helped visitors discover their own inner hero. It was a difficult concept to pull off, requiring a new blend of storytelling and technology. The park opened on June 7th, 1990, and Spielberg was there to do the honors. The most popular opening day attraction, the E.T. Adventure, established a lasting style. Spielberg and composer John Williams continued their collaboration. It's the first time a ride was given an original score. The ride starts where the film ended, taking riders across the galaxy to E.T.'s home world. E.T. proved that a single attraction could please people of all ages. Another early landmark attraction was Back to the Future. It would serve as a prototype for the park's immersive thrill rides. Soon after we opened the park, we then opened Back to the Future. And that really was what I call a threshold attraction. It took us to a whole new level of immersion between motion bases and film. The Back to the Future movies were made in the technological dark age. None contained any computer-generated graphics. The film's effects were generated with optical techniques and detailed miniature models. The Back to the Future ride used a new Omnimax projection system. Each frame of film is 10 times larger than a standard movie theater and contains 12 channels of surround sound. The physical element of the ride comes from a dozen DeLorean cars on hydraulic motion platforms. Each car is mounted on four pistons, able to rise, fall, and tilt to follow the action on the screen. Universal Studios Florida turned out to be a huge success and crowds exceeded expectations. Universal got to work on a second theme park, Islands of Adventure. For Islands, we went down a different path to distinguish it from Universal, create an experience where people actually went into these worlds that they had never been able to experience before, like Dr. Seuss Landing or the Marvel Universe or Jurassic Park or Toon Lagoon, where all the characters of the cartoons and comic books came to life. The new park would take seven years to complete, occupy over 100 acres, and cost a cool billion dollars. Islands of Adventure not only expanded Universal's footprint, but as attendance increased, it allowed the parks to turn their attention to even newer attractions. The team's next endeavor was bringing to life an action-adventure movie with a supernatural twist. Revenge of the Mummy started with a clash between thrills and a story. The Mummy is my favorite ride at Universal. It is a dark thrill ride, roller coaster, 
that you don't know what's next. There's a wall of fire, there's a roof of fire, there's flames shooting upwards. The concept called for a roller coaster ride through Egyptian tombs. The ride catapults guests at speeds up to 45 miles per hour into virtual darkness. Flyby apparitions create the illusion of even greater speed. You'll hear the scream, and then that scream is immediately followed by laughter. Any horror film you've seen in a theater, you see the entire theater jump at a certain scare that, that happens, and then there's usually laughter directly after that because it's the, oh, they got me, or I let my guard down. One of the greatest challenges was creating an effect where fire licked across the ceiling. Three pins, each larger than an SUV, were suspended. The shallow sides trapped the natural gas. When the gas was ignited, the flames rolled eerily beneath the pans. It was fire coming from the ceiling. It looked like it was yeah. coming down on us, like about to touch us, and it was hot. It looked like it did in the movie. Like, it looked so real. I never want guests to come out of an attraction and think about the technology that was used to create the experience. I'd rather have them come out and go, wow, that was incredible, and then a beat later go, I wonder how they did it. The parks also know how to appeal to a guest's lighter side. In 2008, the Simpsons clan made the leap off the small screen with the Simpsons ride. Welcome to Krusty's Thrilltacular Spins Around Z Teen Operated Thrill Ride. It feels like a real roller coaster, but crazier. Sometimes when you look down, you feel like you're actually like falling down. There's like a huge waterfall that you fall down and you're like looking straight down at the water and you feel like you're gonna die, but in a fun way. <laughs> the Simpsons ride allows guests to join the cartoon characters as they visit Krusty Land, a unique theme park within a theme park comedy thrill ride. Gracie Films on The Simpsons Ride was such a joy because they wrote the scripts for The Simpsons Ride. So this was the real deal in every piece of art, every character drawing, every color that we have in the attraction. We worked closely with Matt Greening and Jim Brooks to develop it. This was the first full-blown ride based on the animated television series. It features no less than 24 characters, all voiced by the original actors. The ride vehicle is precisely programmed to synchronize with the action on screen. A new digital video projection system was devised for the lofty purpose of making Homer's rear end appear 60 feet tall. After the ride, guests are invited to visit the Simpsons' hometown of Springfield, from Krusty Burger to Duff Brewery and Moe's Tavern. Insiders like travel blogger and universal consultant Angie Orth know where to grab Homer's favorite foods. The world's first permanent Quickie Mart is in the town of Springfield at Universal Orlando. A poo is there, you can get a squishy, you can get those donuts with the pink frosting, sort of any of those special products that you can only get in Springfield, you can get at the Quickie Mart. A year after the Simpsons ride debuted, a new presence arose to tower 17 stories high. Universal built an interactive thrill coaster, merging music, technology, and adrenaline. Hollywood Rip Ride Rocket was a chance for us to do something really unusual. I mean, take a thrill ride and build music into it, and not only are you able to select your own music and score your own ride, but you can also create your own music video in the process. Riders use personal touch pads to program the soundtrack for their ride. When you first get on, you put the lap bar over you, you see the screen, and they give you all these choices for what songs you want to pick for your ride. But there's also a secret playlist, so all you have to do is hold down the logo for five to ten seconds, then it'll give you the option to punch in some secret codes. Now, you have to research the secret codes before, and you can find them online, but you choose which one you want, and then you get sort of that extra special VIP rock and roll experience. Their selection screeches out at 90 decibels as they hurtle through a stomach-churning series of aerial maneuvers. When you get on Rip Ride Rocket, the first thing that happens is you go straight up to the sky. And it feels like you're going forever, and it's really scary. And that's the moment where you think, why am I doing this? I don't even like roller coasters that much, and I should be off this thing. This coaster accelerates through the double take the world's largest non-inverted loop, the treble clap, 
where guests burst through a building facade, and the aptly named Jump Cut, a spiraling negative gravity scream inducer. Coming up, the making of an epic thrill ride. The challenge with Transformers was how do we deliver the scale and the level of detail and the action that these movies deliver. And bringing to life the magical world of everyone's favorite boy wizard. Next on Universal Orlando, behind the scenes. At Universal Orlando, pop culture icons come alive and visitors leap through the screen to become the story. 25 years of innovation and imagination have made this resort a global destination. It's all about authenticity for these attractions. Things like Harry Potter and The Simpsons and Despicable Me, they're worldwide phenomenon. So there's a great expectation from our guests when they come to visit these attractions that it's going to be the real thing. This is the one place on Earth where anyone can mingle with the mischievous minions of Despicable Me in the aptly titled 3D ride, Minion Mayhem. We wanted to do something that was very, very specific just for a universal guest experience. It wasn't the first film, and it wasn't based on the, on the second film. It was its own story. So we decided to turn guests into minions. What could be better than becoming a minion? The events take place exactly one year after the first film and follow Drew's daughters as they celebrate the anniversary of their adoption. We wanted to have that, that same emotional experience with those characters but we wanted to have something that was completely different. The ride itself appeals to the heart and the solar plexus. A whimsical tale plays out while riders enjoy the ups and downs of a sophisticated motion simulator. The 3D system that we use is Infotech system, and it's really an amazing system that the clarity of the off-axis viewing on these attractions where you have the Infotech 3D system is spectacular. In some of the old ways, things would get a little fuzzy or the color would change, but the Infotech system allows us to bring guests right up close to the screen or a little bit off access to the screen, and you feel like you're still in the middle of all the world. Guests exiting the ride are directed into a disco, complete with interactive video screens where they can boogie down with a minion. In 2013, Transformers The Ride 3D burst on the scene. Riders fight alongside Optimus Prime and Bumblebee, desperately trying to keep the AllSparks safe from enemy hands. Its bone-jarring mix of high-definition film and flight simulation make riders one with the robots. In the words of Michael Bay, director of the Transformers movies, the ride envelops the audience and makes them feel like they're in the world of Transformers. Transformers is an epically huge ride. It's loud and it's just like the movies and there's a ton of these robot creatures fighting each other and the sound effects are amazing. Oh my gosh, it totally feels like you are in the movie. It was so real, and like it's the 3D effects, they jump on your car and you jump back, and it's hard to keep your eyes open when things are flying at you, but there are always things flying at you. Transformers took more than two years from concept to completion. It carried on the tradition dating back to the E.T. adventure, a freewheeling collaboration between the original producers and Universal's creative team. You spend a lot of time on the details. We worked with the writers who worked on the original film, and with Michael Bay, the director of the Great Transformers series, the authenticity of bringing Michael's vision into the media was enormous. It was as big as Megatron, because nobody knows those characters better than Michael. He saw what it was like taking it from the two-dimensional screen and bringing it into a three-dimensional reality for the attraction. Well done, Freedom Fighter. But Universal wasn't done topping itself. Coming up, see the epic creation of the wizarding world of Harry Potter. We started with what are the most compelling parts of the fiction that we could bring to life, and, and that's where we began the journey. Harry and his friends take center stage for the making of one of the world's most immersive and technologically advanced theme park attractions ever built. Next on Universal Orlando, behind the scenes. Universal Orlando is world-renowned as the epicenter for innovation in entertainment. Its Ride the Movies concept has allowed millions of fans to discover their own superhero. In 2006, 
the Universal team embarked on a top secret project. They would create the most complete, most detailed theme environment ever attempted with the wizarding world of Harry Potter. Over five years, a 20-acre complex arose to house Hogsmeade Village, complete with dozens of locations and characters from the books. The centerpiece is Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey, a simulated flight around Hogwarts Castle. To the delight of Universal, J.K. Rowling insisted on active participation. No expense was spared in creating this unique themed environment, and even today, $265 million goes a long way. To ensure authenticity, Stuart Craig, production designer on all eight of the Harry Potter movies, oversaw development and construction. It's about a four-year process. It's kind of like a film production would start. You know, you start with storyboards and with scripts or treatments. Very small team, and then as you go along, the team gets larger and larger. I mean, we start with eight or ten people, and by the end, there's about three or four hundred people that are working on that, plus a lot of craftsmen that are around the world, vendors and companies that help us develop this. At every point, original artists were brought in to recreate their magic. Even the same musicians heard on the movie's soundtracks recorded new arrangements for the park at London's Abbey Road Studios. The Harry Potter stories are some of the greatest epic tales ever told over 4,500 pages of text and nearly 20 hours of feature films. Was there any way to match the sky-high expectations of the world's millions of devoted Potterites? With Wizarding World of Harry Potter, you had these seven fantastic books, and J.K. Rowling just did an amazing job of creating these really compelling characters and these wondrous, magical places that you conjured in your mind as you read the books. The Hogwarts Castle was a key part of that iconography of the fiction, so that was really the anchor of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Hogsmeade, and then, of course, there was the Hogsmeade Village. What we hoped was that people would come through the arch of the Hogsmeade Village, and they would be awestruck. And ultimately, that is what happened. I mean, you could stand there on opening day and see people come through that gate and their eyes would light up and their jaw would drop and some would shed a tear that they would actually be able to go to the place that they felt so strongly about from both the books and the films. When you come in through the arch of Hogsmeade Village, you get a great view of the entire village, but also you start getting a little peek of Hogwarts Castle. So that was designed purposely. And as you come around the street, which curves around, of course, you want to reveal more and more about the village, and eventually you get the full reveal of Hogwarts Castle. Creating a thousand-year-old village required several trips to the old country. We actually went to Scotland, we took samples, we took molds of real stones from Scotland. We took a lot of photos of what the finishes were like, how the stones aged, the moss that grows on the stones, the snow melting, what does it look like in the spring, all these really important details that make things authentic and, and look absolutely real. I think it's the best theme park experience in the world. Anywhere I've been, it kind of ruins you for every other theme park you go to because it's so immersive. The details are so good. And I am a Harry Potter fan, so that makes it even better. But it's just magical. You go in, you hear the songs, and you hear the score, and you smell all the, the good food. And there's something that is truly magical about it, and you can't get that anywhere else. Visitors rush to the most popular ride in the Wizarding Land, Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey, for a chance to fly with Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Entering into the gates of Hogwarts Castle is a passage into another universe. So we designed this castle to appear to be about 700 feet tall. As you can see, the scale is slightly forced because we couldn't go 700 feet up in the air. We had some limitations with the FAA and different things, but but we actually are very successful because everybody who comes through here thinks the castle is really 700 feet tall. Inside, every corner brings a shock of recognition and meticulous attention to detail. Dumbledore's office. I sense that at the Hogwarts house jewels. Talking portraits. Don't worry, there's room for all. You eventually run into Ron, Harry, and Hermione, who tell us, forget about the whole history of Hogwarts. 
come with us to a Quidditch match. It's much more fun, it's much more exciting, and we find out that Hermione has enchanted some of the benches for us to fly to the Quidditch match, fly along with Harry and Ron, and go watch the match. Behind the scenes, the ride experience began years earlier, when the cast was filmed in England on the same sets used for the movies. The key challenge? Seamlessly transitioning between projected images and live sets. This type of attraction is known as a scenic dark ride, an indoor amusement with guided vehicles traveling through an elaborate maze of sights and sounds. For rides like this, the illusion of flight is the holy grail. The closest feeling to that is actually like being in a helicopter, the way it kind of twists your body and turns, but the visuals really, really help. I can't say enough, it is a fantastic ride. There's sound when you fly fast, this whooshing sound, and there's also the sensation of wind. I mean, it's important to us to really trigger on all the, the senses, and that's what we do best at Universal, is really place you in these environments where we create all the elements you expect. That was unreal. That was unreal. The experience was created with tremendous attention to detail, including the sensation of smell. The sense is also something else that we want to bring to the experience. When you go in the pine forest, you want to smell the pines, so we have some of that. But there are certain scents you have to be careful with because they will linger. We had the scent of a fireplace, but it turned out to be one of the scents that lingered too much and carried on and ended up smelling like the fireplace in the next scene, so we couldn't use that anymore. No existing ride system could deliver the vision created by Rolling and Universal. A new technology was devised, and while many aspects of it remain secret, it relies on coordinated yet independent robots. It takes you through a Quidditch field, you're flying with dragons, you get chased by Dementors, it's an insane it's ride. Scary. Yeah, it's super it's crazy, scary. and you're oh flying God. super fast. You might be surprised to know that as you're flying around the Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey ride, you're actually sitting in a robot and there are 48 other robots running around in the same space with you. All that technology, which is really, really sophisticated, is totally invisible to the experience, and that's all by design. It's, it's really not about the technology, although we spend an inordinate amount of time developing it. The ride is about the experience. You've shown great bravery. Feel free to return to Hogwarts at any time. Now tuck your elbows in. Only insiders know all the fun details of this land like a real-life post office. Here at the Owl Post in Hogsmeade, you can actually mail postcards back home to people who didn't get to come on your awesome vacation, and you get the Hogsmeade postmark, so you can prove you were here in the wizarding world. For many, that vacation continues on one of the other signature rides in the wizarding world of Harry Potter Hogsmeade, like the interlocking inverted thrill coasters known as Dragon Challenge. First, the line passes through a ruined castle. Riders emerge from eerie darkness to the main event, a Chinese fireball and a Hungarian horntail. The Dragon Challenge coaster is a double coaster. One's red, one's blue, and it's hard to say which one's better. I've ridden both a lot. Um, I think I might like the red one better. They're both awesome. They've got so many inversions and corkscrews that it's a wild ride. This is a world of contrasts. Everyone can enjoy the thrills of a roller coaster, but it takes a true Harry Potter devotee to appreciate the subtler touches. There are so many layers to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Just in the windows, if you take the time to look at every single window, you'll see this attention to detail, especially if you've read the books. You really see every nook and cranny is filled with details that a real Potterphile would appreciate. Even Harry Potter's food and drink have been faithfully recreated. So we did go and meet multiple times with J.K. Rowling in Scotland. And one of the trips, we came along with our chef, Chef Jason, and he had concocted this little special mix of uh, butterbeer and pumpkin juice. And we had a tasting with J.K. Rowling, and she tried it, and we all knew right away that when we saw her smile, we had hit the nail on the head. This was really what she had envisioned. Hogsmeade isn't just a location, it's a place, it's a feeling, it's, it's food, it's a sound, it's a smell, and here, every, all of that's captured. When you walk in, you're like, I've been here before, I know that store, I know the three broomsticks, and it's just, 
I think it's just amazing. Shortly after we opened The Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Hogsmeade, uh, it became apparent that it was wildly successful. People were just thrilled with the results, so we pretty quickly went to work on expanding it. <laughs> the conventional solution? Add more Harry Potter space right next to the original attraction. But the wizards at Universal saw a better way to maximize the Potter experience. They would build the iconic Hogwarts Express train and use it to link two different parks. We thought, how cool would it be to build London and hide Diagon Alley, as it is in the fiction, behind this full-size facade? And then be able to connect the two with the Hogwarts Express, which is really true to the fiction. I mean, they aren't geographically close together in the story, so because we had these two theme parks, we were able to really create the authentic experience of having the two places and having the train of the Hogwarts Express connect the two. Hogwarts Express train is an exact replica of the one from the films. On board, the experience surrounds riders. So to be able to create this whole experience along the way when you ride the Hogwarts Express, we had to invent some new technology as well, because really you're riding from one park to another, and you're really going backstage at Universal Orlando. And we didn't want a guest to be suddenly taken back into Orlando and Florida. So once you get onto the train, we have a special screen technology that is seamlessly going on and takes you along to all the scenery from Scotland all the way to London, or London and back to Scotland. The lush countrysides of England and Scotland roll by punctuated by startling sights like Hagrid on his flying motorbike and the Weasley twins on brooms. Look the other way and familiar characters come romping down the train's corridors. Coming up, the creation of the wizarding world of Harry Potter, Diagon Alley. Almost as a joke, we placed a dragon on top of Gringotts Bank and we all looked at it and thought, oh my God, this is meant to be. Next on Universal Orlando Behind the Scenes. The Hogwarts Express takes visitors to Universal Studios and part two of the ultimate Harry Potter experience. Over five million guests have traveled on this train, about 20 times the entire population of Orlando. They enter Diagon Alley, a twisting labyrinth with no straight lines, moody and mysterious from the get-go. Usually there'll be a big sign out in front of an attraction, but because Diagon is hidden in London and we wanted to be as authentic as possible, there is no sign to Diagon. There's just the opening in the brick wall that you walk through. So that took a little bit of convincing that we'd actually be able to be really true to fiction and hide the entrance. Once inside, watch out for scary creatures. Almost as a joke, we placed the dragon on top of Gringotts Bank because in the stories, the dragon escapes the bank with Harry, Ron, and Hermione. And we all looked at it and thought, oh my God, this is meant to be. Practitioners of the dark arts can find all they desire in Nocturne Alley and its infamous shop, Borgen and Burks. Nocturne Alley has a black light, and when you go in, suddenly you can see the location appear on your map. It's very dark, it's very scary in there, but there are some really fun things to see. Harry Potter acquired his very first wand at Ollivander's shop, and now muggles can follow in his footsteps. <laughs> Travel blogger and Universal consultant Angie Orth explains the ins and outs of wand selection. When you come to Diagon Alley, you have to get a wand from Ollivander's. He is the master wand maker, and he's the one who can help you pick out exactly which one is perfect for you. And once you get it, you can walk all around Diagon Alley, and there's secret little places to do magic. You don't want to miss it. We developed a technology that was quite complex that would enable the wands to actually trigger a series of moments and magic throughout the space. People of all ages love to get the wand and go out and search out these moments throughout the land and cause these things to happen by casting spells that they remember from the fiction. I felt like a character in the movie, like just walking through for the very first time, like Harry in the first movie. I just, it just took my breath away. All this is merely preamble to the main attraction in Diagon Alley, Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts. The line for Gringotts Bank can be kind of long, but don't worry about it because it's an amazing queue. You walk all through the amazing lobby with 
this unbelievably large and expensive chandelier. There's goblins everywhere, animatronic. They are so cool and so lifelike that you feel like they're staring into your soul. So watch out, they're very cranky. Move along to the security office to have your Gringotts identification photo taken. So for the goblins, what we did is we really studied the expressions from the films and we did duplicate the exact same motion and expressions because what we found is the fans that come and, and visit Gringotts Bank and all of Wizarding World of Harry Potter are really wanting to see if it's true to the film. So they will come here and videotape the goblins and go back to the films and then pause the films and realize that, wow, this is exactly like the films. It's the same faces and the same expressions, except they come to life here. I must get back to work. Escape from Gringotts is a motion-based roller coaster thrill ride that immerses riders in the action on screen. In Gringotts, we saw the opportunity to have the villains play a much bigger role. So being able to place Voldemort and Bellatrix Lestrange in that environment and bring us face to face with that aspect of the fiction was really something that we thought would be quite compelling and it turned out to be just that. It wasn't the first ride to combine 4K animation with 3D projection and live action, but it was the first to do all that within 360 degree sets. You totally felt immersed. It was surrounding you and you just couldn't wait till the next thing that happened. It was exciting. It just felt like a rush going through. There are sections of the tracks that break and make you fall down deep under the bank. There are moments where you're face to face with the dragon, you can feel the heat, you can feel the fire from the dragon. Giant trolls are coming and breaking a section of the track and throwing us down other sections of the bank. It's really everything amped up to a level that we hadn't done before. You should be safe in there! It's a new experience, 3D, with the roller coaster ride while you're kind of immersed in the 4D. It's new, I mean, this is definitely different. Soon, riders are journeying through cavernous vaults and are thrown into the iconic moment from the films when our three heroes break into the bank to retrieve a magical horcrux that could defeat Lord Voldemort. Up next, step into a universe all its own at Marvel's Superhero Island. Some people have a coffee in the morning, and I'll take a ride on Hulk. Well, you're really there with all these characters one-on-one. -on -one. Next, on Universal Orlando Behind the Scenes. While both Wizarding Worlds are filled with surprise and delight, Universal's Islands of Adventure has seven spectacularly themed lands designed with the thrill seeker in mind. So you're in seven different lands, seven different islands with some of your favorite heroes that you actually go through the adventure with. So it's really a participatory kind of park where you're really there with all these characters one on one. Each island is a universe of its own. Marvel Superhero Island is so bright, you definitely feel like you're immediately stepping into that Marvel universe. The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man features an ultra-high-def 4K projection system and newly developed 3D Spider-Vision glasses. The finale is a 400-foot sensory drop off the top of a skyscraper. The drop is entirely an illusion, created by visual elements moving past you. You get caught and saved at the end with the... the I hate wedding. heights, so it made me jump a little bit. I mean, I thought the drop was real, so... <laughs> In fact, the vehicles never leave the ground and only move a few miles per hour. The Incredible Hulk coaster was also one of the original attractions at Marvel Superhero Island. Riders get launched out of a gamma ray tube into a zero-g roll 150 feet in the air. The ride catapults guests from zero to 40 miles per hour in two seconds flat with the force of a jet taking off from an aircraft carrier. Some people have a coffee in the morning and I'll take a ride on Hulk. To have the opportunity to do what we do, to create these experiences and to do it and get paid for it, that's a treat. The launch of the Hulk draws so much power that the city of Orlando won't allow Universal to use their electricity. Instead, Universal has on-site turbines that propel a new launch every 60 seconds.
For Universal Orlando, innovation means creating unique worlds. The cat in the hat can only be found in the pages of Dr. Seuss books and here. When you get into Dr. Seuss's books, each one of them has this great moral fabric to it. In addition to the wonderful rhyme and the words and the story and the characters, each one of them has this great message. So it was really important to us and to Audrey Geisel, Dr. Seuss's wife, to bring that all to life. There are no straight lines in Dr. Seuss's books or in Seuss Landing. While the whimsical island was under construction, nature became an unlikely collaborator. When Hurricane Andrew came through South Florida several years ago, the palm trees got very twisted. So a lot of those palm trees were brought up to use in Seuss Landing because they're already kind of wonky and no straight lines and they were a perfect fit. Coming up, witness the park's terrifying transformation. During the month of September and October, the park literally transforms into a living horror film. You go through those turnstiles, and you're gonna be faced with nightmares that you could only dream about. <laughs> and get a sneak peek of the newest monster attraction. Next on Universal Orlando Behind the Scenes. When summer turns to fall, a theme park by day turns into terror town at night with Halloween Horror Nights. From chainsaw maniacs to vampires to zombies, there's no end to the monsters stalking guests. Universal created the horror genre with classics like Dracula and Frankenstein. And here, the tradition lives on. Franchises like Halloween and The Walking Dead dominate the bloodletting. Our goal is to drop you into the scenes from that series. You are among the walkers and being attacked from every single angle. And all of our mazes are designed in a manner that is film quality. So 360 degrees, up, down, left, right, you are immersed within that series, Walking Dead. Ah! <laughs> While the premise stays the same, each year the experience is different. It pays to keep people guessing. Any guest that comes year after year is going to get a completely different experience. It's like horror. Once you see a horror film nine or ten times, you know where all the scares are. You know how they work. So we want to keep our guests on their toes when they're experiencing Halloween Horror Nights. Most visitors have no idea how complex these shows are or how long it takes to prepare them. We will actually create next year's event a month before this year's event starts. It's more than a 365-day process to get all of our brands in line and getting designs for costumes. They're all very layered. Thousands and thousands of gallons of blood are created and used during the event, all made in-house every single year. We also like to employ even smells into the mazes. We have an entire meeting with a vendor who creates smells for our event, anything from charcoal to wood burning to various stages of decay and it's a very unique meeting because <laughs> we basically get these vials and, and these little tabs that we have to kind of smell and see if it's something we want to put in the maze yeah you don't want to go before or after lunch <laughs> like so many of the attractions here horror nights are all about evoking screams and laughs there are many individuals that go through the mazes that absolutely lose their mind. They can't be consoled. They're coming out on their hands and knees. They're screaming and yelling. They're leaving the maze and running hundreds of feet beyond the exit, thinking they're still inside the maze, and then they're laughing. And then it's like this almost communal moment, you know, with whomever they're with, that we made it, we did it. It's kind of a rite of passage. In the 1990s, Universal's creative team decided to transform a thriving theme park into a resort destination. They would build CityWalk, a nighttime complex including more than 20 restaurants. The expansion reached fruition with the construction of four themed resort hotels. Hard Rock Hotel, Lowe's Royal Pacific Resort, Lowe's Portofino Bay Hotel, and Universal's Cabana Bay Beach Resort. The idea here is that your vacation doesn't end when you leave the theme park. When you come back to the hotel, we want you to continue to have fun. All the pools at the property are great immersive experiences with water slides, 
lazy rivers, interactive play areas. Most hotels are just a short water taxi ride to the park, and all offer guests the chance to beat the lines by entering an hour before the general public. This property, Universal's Cabana Bay Beach Resort, the idea here is that you're not really captured in a place as much as you are as a time. This is the late 50s, early 60s, load everyone up in the station wagon and drive down to Florida. This is the beach vacation of the 50s and 60s. The essential ingredient is a sense of authenticity. Years are spent on fantastically detailed research. Before the Lowe's Portofino Bay Hotel was built, an army of artisans swarmed across Italy to acquire designs and materials. One of the things that's interesting about Portofino, if you look at the detail of the architecture, the facades are relatively flat, and then we paint them with trompe l'oeil paint to make them appear to have more depth than they do and to give this aesthetic of brick and what have you. The artists at Universal have been entrusted with creating an American legacy but they insist they're just getting started. Here at Islands of Adventure, we're going to actually bring you to Skull Island and face to face with King Kong himself. Skull Island Reign of Kong is going to be unlike anything we've done before. Well, the whole premise is that it's the early 1930s and you're on Skull Island to discover a species of unknown origin, but things go awry and it quickly turns into a fight for survival. We have an enormous ride vehicle that's our expedition truck. You'll go through temple ruins, dense jungle. You'll meet hostile natives and finally come face to face with King Kong himself. We've been going strong for the last 25 years and we've opened 18 new guest experiences just in the last five years, which is just an unheard of growth. And we're not stopping. Universal has so much to offer and they're always adding something new. I cannot wait for King Kong to get back. It's a classic, it's one of my favorite movies. So I'm pumped to actually experience <laughs> it for the first time. This journey has got us up to this point where we now have this place that has become world renowned as the place to come and vacation with your family and we continue to build on it. Next year it'll be King Kong and the year after that it'll be Volcano Bay. We're just going to continue down this road and continue to push the envelope and innovate and create really memorable experiences for families around the world that last them a lifetime.